There we are. Okay. So we just wrapped up with, if we're going to invent stories, if we're, if we're giving them, the critic, their, their position that these stories are made up decades, generations after the effect, after the effect, after the event, we're, we're asking why. Why would gen, primarily Gentile Christians, uh, 30 or 40 or 50 years later, why would they make up a story that involves women, why would they make up a story that involves a Sanhedrin member? Um, I touched on something like this a little bit earlier. This is called the Jerusalem factor. There is no other tradition for the origins of Christianity. Christianity began in Jerusalem. That's even acknowledged by Bart Ehrman, once again in Triumph, uh, page 75. Acts the book of Acts in our Bible records that it's in Jerusalem where the apostles are first preaching the resurrection. The Jewish leaders knew where Jesus' tomb was. If Jesus' body was still in the tomb, the resurrection could be easily disproven, right? So, if you're just going to start making up a story... Is it a good idea to start making up a story in Jerusalem? Jerusalem's where he was condemned. Outside of Jerusalem is where he was crucified. Outside of Jerusalem is where he was buried. Is this really the best place to start making up stories about him? Or wouldn't it be much smarter if we're just going to make up stories? Let's go to Rome. Let's go to Athens. Let's go to Ephesus. Let's go to Alexandria. Because if we stay in Jerusalem and we're just making up stories, it's not going to be very hard to disprove our stories. Uh, the Jewish authorities knew where Jesus' tomb was. The Romans knew where Jesus' tomb was. If the body is still in the tomb, all the Jews have to do is tell you, you just listen to this fellow Peter. He was just preaching that Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. His tomb, you go down this street, you take a left. There's his tomb. Look inside. The body's still there. You, you can easily disprove if the body is still in, in the tomb. But if we sneak off and we go to Rome or we go to Alexandria and I start telling you that there was this fellow in Jerusalem who was killed and raised three days later from the dead, well, now you've got two choices. You can either believe me or you, you can disbelieve me. But are you really in the ancient world going to use your resources and travel all the way up to Jerusalem to find out if my story is true or not. No. Travel is expensive. Uh, travel is dangerous. Uh, traveling all of that way, if I'm preaching this in Alexandria or I'm preaching this in Ephesus, this is the great place, if we're just going to make up stories, to go make up a story. If I want to make up a story about the mayor of uh, Montrose, don't you think it would be a good idea to get out of town? You know, I mean, I mean, it's not really hard to get to Junction, is it? But I mean, I could go back to Montana, you know, or I could go to Texas, you know, and I could make up stories about the mayor of Montrose. Now there's the Internet. Now there's email and so forth. But in the ancient world, there wasn't, you know. So if we're just making up a story, we know that Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, but we're going to make up stories that he was. Would it be smart or would it be stupid to stay in town and start preaching this? If we're just making up the stories, it's very stupid to just stay here and to just, uh, to just uh, start making up these stories. Uh, this goes back to uh, that creed there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, this is according, once again, to critic Bart Ehrman uh, in, in uh, th this, uh, this debate that I still need to watch the whole thing, Did Jesus uh, Exist? Bart Ehrman agrees that Christianity originated in Jerusalem. There's no other story about, you know, there's no ancient tradition that Christianity began in Samaria. There's no ancient tradition that uh, Christianity began down in Egypt. Christianity began in Jerusalem and it began within one to two years of the cross. So it didn't begin. Christianity didn't start some 30 or 40 years after the cross. The, the, them preaching the resurrection didn't start some 30 or 40 years. 
It happened in Jerusalem and it happened within a year or two of the event. Some people have argued against Jesus being buried because they have argued that the Romans never released the bodies of crucified victims. This actually contradicts what we know from Roman sources. Uh, concerning the corpses of people who are punished, this is uh, in the document uh, Duties of the um, Proconsul. So this is a Roman document you know, telling a proconsul, you're about to go be a procurator, procurator. You're about to go be a governor in, uh, in this, this area. This is what your duties are. It specifically says that the bodies of the condemned should not be refused their relatives and may be buried. In the document sentences, in other words, a criminal sentence, in the document senses, bodies of persons punished should be given to whomever requests them for burial. So the Romans viewed punishment as, yes, we're going to kill this person. But once they're dead, what threat are they to us? And so if mom or brother comes to get the body, give them the body, you know? Go ahead, go bury your dead, you know? They're dead, they're not, they're not a threat to us anymore. Uh -huh. Philo, remember Philo is the Alexandrian Jew who uh, is pre pretty contemporary of this time period, maybe a little bit afterwards. Jews would have wanted the bodies taken off the cross. In the Gospel of John, who is it that, that is getting concerned? The Sabbath's about to start, break their legs. Who, who is it that wants their, the, the criminals and Jesus' legs broken? It's the Jews. Why do they want their legs broken? Because they want them to die so that once they're dead, they can be taken off the crosses and buried. It's the Jews that are, are making this request. Philo, in his special laws, book three, let not the sun set on a person hanging on a tree. Jews understood that reference, hanging on a tree, to include cruci crucifixion. Now, in our language, when we think about hanging, we think about by the throat. We think, you know, we, we, we don't really use hanging and crucifixion as, as synonyms, do we? But the Jews understood somebody crucified is hanging on a tree and they need to be taken down before sunset. Uh, 11QT, line 46. 11Q is cave 11 at Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls. T is the temple scroll. The temple scroll... Uh, uh, associates hanging on a tree in crucifixion with Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse 32. Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse 32, if you punish somebody, you, you hang them on a tree, make sure to bury them before the sun goes down so that the land will not be polluted. So that's from the Bible, that's from the book of Deuteronomy, and the Jews understood that to include crucifixion. So the Jews wouldn't have objected to the criminals or Jesus being taken down from the cross. They wanted that because, you know, once a person's dead, they didn't, they didn't want their body to, to stay up there. That's gross, isn't it? And, and I, I mean, we can vilify them for, for hating Jesus and wanting him dead, but they would not, you, you notice, the Gospels don't include anybody, the priests going to Pilate and saying, no, don't, don't let him have the body, you know? They want them to have the body. What the Jews want, what the, the priests want is they want a guard at the temple. Or excuse me, they want a guard at the tomb, not the temple. Because they're concerned about the body after that. But nobody is concerned about the body coming down off the cross. Josephus, now here is where I, I, want, I want to know a little bit more. Um, Josephus has two passages that refer to the practice of capital punishment and people being buried after capital punishment. Now, what I don't understand is Bart Ehrman says there's only one reference. Now, it's very possible I misunderstood what Bart Ehrman was saying. Perhaps, perhaps he, he was referring to something specific, indicating there's only one. 
Perhaps he's misunderstanding. Perhaps he doesn't know. Uh, but Josephus has two references. The first one comes uh, from Antiquities Book 4. If somebody has blasphemed the Lord, let him be hanged and then let him be buried. Wars, once again, book four, condemned and crucified, buried before the sun goes down. There's a story uh, there uh, as we're getting closer and closer to the destruction of Jerusalem. The Jews have allied themselves with the Idumeans. Uh, my enemy's enemy is my friend, young grasshopper. Jews did not like the Edumeans. Edumeans did not like the Jews. But when Rome is, is going to destroy you both, you know, you, you're willing to make some alliances that you otherwise wouldn't make. The Edumeans apparently crucified some people because they were, you know, rebels or, or something that they disagreed with. And then they just took their bodies and threw them out. And this made the Jews go. No, 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 no. You don't just take a body and throw it out. You bury a body. Bart Ehrman, I believe, makes a critical mistake when it comes to this passage and saying how it does not apply to Jesus. He argues that this passage is written during a time of war and then argues that especially as we get so much closer to the actual destruction of Jerusalem, uh, Josephus records that every day the Romans are capturing more and more Jews and crucifying them just, you know, outside of an arrow shot from the walls of Jerusalem. And they're doing this in such a way that that's, it's a psychological victory over the Jews still in Jerusalem. This is what's going to happen to you eventually. We're going to get you eventually. And those bodies, the bodies of, of thousands Thousands of Jews crucified in the siege of Jerusalem. Oftentimes they weren't buried. Oftentimes they were eaten by dogs. They were eaten by birds, etc., etc. They, they disintegrated and, and whatnot, right? And, and the critic points to the siege of Jerusalem and thousands of Jews being crucified and left on the crosses. And he points to that and says, see, that's what the Romans did. So Jesus' body was not taken off the cross. It was left there and it you know, was eaten by dogs and so forth. Does anybody happen to notice? We're talking about wartime here. We're not talking about wartime here. Do you think that it's possible... That during times of war, things are different than during times of not war. When we read the gospel accounts and we read Rome's involvement in the, the crucifixion of Jesus, does Rome really seem to care terribly much about this? No, they're really not in this. They just are the, 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 the tool that the Jews are using to get rid of one of their enemies. And in some ways, Pilate is even being a little bit of a pain to the Jews, you know. Uh, he, he puts the, up on Jesus' cross the king of the Jews. And what do the Jews say? No, 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 no. Don't say that he was the king of the Jews. Say that he claimed to be the king of the Jews. What did Pilate respond? What I have written, I have written. So, you know, I mean, it's a little bit of a, hey, you made me do this. But, I mean, to, to get a little cross, it, it, it's him giving them the middle finger, you know, after the fact. You know, I don't want to say something like that. But, I mean, it is, right? Um, so, back here, Jesus was this Jewish preacher, Rome didn't care too much about him. The few instances we have of Rome interacting with Jesus, a centurion wants his slave or his, his son healed. That's really the only thing we see as far as Rome and Jesus goes. And eventually Rome feels like they're being manipulated, they're being used to kill him. So Rome, I, I, I mean, sure, they, they're getting, they're happy to kill another Jew. It's not like they're, they're having a moral objection to, to this. But it's not like they have a dog in the fight, you know? And, and once Jesus is dead, Rome doesn't care. I mean, Jesus wasn't leading a revolt against Rome. Pilate saw through that little charade of, of, the, of the priests, right? So once Jesus is dead, does Pilate have any reason to not release the body of Jesus? No. 
He doesn't care. He's tired of being played. He's tired of playing this silly little game between this Jewish group and that Jewish group, huh? So uh, Rome had no reason. Rome had no reason not to release the body of Jesus. There are no other ancient traditions. When the critic today says that they believe the body of Jesus was left hanging on the tree and it eventually was eaten by dogs and, and, and so forth, and da, 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 da. they say that based on their own imagination. They say that based on their own presuppositions. They don't say that based on, we found this ancient document written sometime in the first century that says Jesus stayed on the cross. They're making it up as they go along. We have no other traditions dating this early other than Jesus was buried in a tomb. Now some 300, 400, we get some secondary gospels. Uh, one of them claims that Jesus didn't die on the cross. Uh, eventually the Quran uh, says that uh, Allah saved Jesus and then took him up to heaven. But we're talking about hundreds of years after the fact. If Jesus is crucified back here in 30 or 33 AD, remember I told you that nearer the event, the testimony is more valuable, right? So something 600 years after the, the fact, does that really speak with any authority? No. There is no other ancient tradition, there is no other ancient story about what happened to the body of Jesus other than it was buried in a tomb. And anything else is just conjecture. <clears throat> Empty tomb and appearances. This is very, very important. The, the Gospels not only tell us that there was an empty tomb, it also tells us that there were appearances. If you had simply appearances, it wouldn't mean a resurrection. And if you simply had an empty tomb, it wouldn't mean a resurrection. Oftentimes, and I'm not trying, especially, I, I, I seriously want to say this to everybody here. It's a common thing that when somebody dies, Within a day or two, somebody says that they saw the person's spirit. You've probably heard stories like that. If you have a story like that, I don't, I'm not going to, to mock you or anything like that, right? But that's a common story, right? Uh, I remember two instances. One, a co-worker of mine, grandma died, and apparently that night grandpa saw grandma at the foot of his bed, you know, or something like that, right? Now here, I'm actually getting a little bit personal because this is actually my family. Uh, my grandfather died. I'm not going to get into all the details of my crazy family because <laughs> we're crazy. But for some reason, I'm there at the house. For some reason, I spend the night that night. Uh, and the next morning at breakfast, my family, people I am biologically related to, are saying, he was here last night. I heard him walking around. Da, 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 da. I'm just going to tell you, I don't believe it. I'm just going to tell you, I don't believe it. When a person you love dies, you're emotional, you're open to suggestion. Every, every, every night there's bumps in the night, huh? Every night the house shifts just a little bit. Every night the, the water pipes just make a, a strange noise. On a night that you're very emotional, on a night that you're open to suggestion, suddenly that sounded a bit more like footsteps and it sounded a bit more like Grandpa was here last night, doesn't it? Uh, I, again, I don't mean to mock you if you have, have anything, but I'm saying out of my own family, we have this story and I don't believe it. Uh, appearances don't mean resurrection though, do they? People don't say that Grandpa died that night and then so-and-so saw them at the foot of the bed. The family doesn't go out saying Grandpa's been resurrected, do they? You know, what they're saying is they had some sort of, of personal, you know, thing that grandma has gone to heaven and everything's OK or something like that. Appearances don't mean resurrection, nor does an empty tomb by itself mean, or, mean a resurrection. We actually have a late document, I believe off the top of my head, I believe it dates from the third century that the gardener says that he moved the body. The gardener says that uh, he had just planted some cabbage or some lettuce or something and he was worried about people coming to view the body. So during the night, he moved the body. 
How he moved the stone and how he got past the guards doesn't matter. He's the one that moved the body, right? So once again, simply an empty tomb doesn't prove the resurrection and simply appearances doesn't prove the resurrection. But in our Gospels and in the book of Acts, we have both. We have an empty tomb and we have appearances. Uh, Once again... um, the First Corinthians 15 Creed, very, very early. Again, even critic Bart Ehrman says it's a very, very early creed. Now, when we lay out the Gospels, Matthew and Luke and John, when it comes to the resurrection accounts, and when it comes especially to people seeing the resurrected Christ, we get mm, 10-ish. Am I on the right slide? Yeah, we get 10-ish. And what I mean by 10-ish is sometimes what Matthew is talking about. Is that what Luke's talking about also? Or is it not? So it's, it's actually a little bit hard to count when it comes to the Gospels. How many resurrection uh, appearances do we have? In uh, John... Uh, In John, we have Mary Magdalene. In Matthew, we have the other women. In Luke, we have the road to Emmaus. In Luke, we have Peter reporting. Still in Luke, we have uh, the disciples without... Or still in Luke, we have the disciples. Is this one the one where Thomas is missing? We don't know. Uh, Then in John, we have the the appearance where Thomas is with them. We have the Galilean fishing trip uh, there in in John. We have the 11 on the mountaintop in Matthew back in uh, Galilee. Is that when the 500, you remember in the creed, uh, Paul says, and he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Was that the mountaintop? Um, And according to Luke, we have the ascension. It's kind of hard to sync all of these together. It's kind of hard to actually say, do we have 11 appearances? Do we have 10 appearances? We have women once again as the primary, the first ones. We have individuals, apparently, uh, according to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus appears to Peter. You'll remember that when the two disciples get back from Emmaus and they find the the guys and they say, we saw the Lord, they say, he appeared to Peter. And that's all we get. He appeared to Peter. We don't get the story of him appearing to Peter. We simply get the statement, he appeared to Peter. Uh, Apparently he appeared to James. Remember, we already covered that. He appears to groups. That's a very important thing, that he appears to groups. He appears to these two obscure disciples on the road to Emmaus. Does anybody happen to remember the names of the two uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus? 100 points. Oh, you are so close. (laughs) Cleopas is one of them, and the other one is not mentioned. Who are they? Who, who are they? Does anybody remember any other story that involves those two? Nope. Uh, the, he appears to the group without Thomas. We don't know where Thomas was. Was, was Thomas out getting, getting the groceries for the group or, or what? And then we get an appearance with Thomas, right? We get times that he, uh, he, he can be seen without being recognized. You'll remember on the road to Emmaus, it specifically says that their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And other times, it seems that right away they recognize him. Seems that right away, there's no doubt in, in their mind who that is. Um, at times he can be touched. At times he can eat. Now, all of these differences are not bad things. They're actually good things. And we'll get to that here in a second. Now, I want to deal very briefly with a couple of natural theories that have ever been proposed 
to explain away all of these details, okay? Now, one, it's not popular today. In fact, it's pretty much abandoned by every scholar today. But it was popular a couple years ago. In fact, the Not History Channel, I'm sorry, the History Channel even did a documentary on it and, and how it was a viable option. You see why I call it the Not History Channel. But the swoon theory, the swoon theory is that Jesus simply passed out while he was up on the cross. He didn't die on the cross. He was placed alive into the tomb and he used ancient healing balms and herbs to heal himself inside the tomb. What ancient balms and healing herbs can be used to make a crucified victim look like an okay guy in three days? Actually, less than three 24-hour days. If there are these ancient balms and herbs that can do this, why aren't we using these today? What, what are these? I want, I want to do, do, do you know that in crucifixion, uh, they've actually done various studies. Now it's, now it's pretty much tradition that it was through the wrist, right? And one of the reasons that people ever argued that it was through the wrist is because the idea was that if they did it through the hand, the hand doesn't have the bone structure the nail would rip through. That actually has been disproven in certain cases where the, 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 the body is light enough. It doesn't prove anything de definitively. <clears throat> when you pierce between here, you get this immediate reaction where the thumb curls and remains curled like this. Okay? By the way, when it comes to moving a stone of significant weight, do you, do you really think your hand stuck in this position, do you really think you're going to get the kind of leverage you're going to need to move? By the way, with these mortal wounds in your wrist, are you really going to have the arm strength required to move a terrific stone out of your way? Regardless of all of that, you see why it's not a very popular theory anymore. Uh, there are ideas that Rome was in on this. Did you hear that? <laughs> the idea that Rome is in on this. Now there was this book written, it was, it was a fantiful, fantiful novel, even more fantif, fantiful. I have to use the English this morning, huh? <laughs> um, then the Da Vinci Code. Uh, one, of, um, one, of, one of the books that ever was written on this was called uh, The Passover Conspiracy. Jesus has arranged everything Absolutely everything. How, by the way, how, how good does arranging often go? You know? But Jesus has arranged everything. He's made a deal with Pilate. He's made a deal with Joseph of Arimathea. And at the last moment, the soldier stabs him with a spear and he dies. And he wasn't supposed to be stabbed with a spear and he wasn't supposed to die. Uh, but Rome is in on the conspiracy in some of the swoon theories. What does Rome have to benefit from Jesus surviving the crucifixion? How, how does Pilate advance himself? How does one of the soldiers advance themselves by letting a crucified, a condemned person live? They're actually in a lot of trouble because you're on the execution squad. If the person that you're given to execute escapes, you're going to be executed. You're a Roman soldier. I don't know how much you get paid. You're, you're probably not going to retire early. You're probably not going to retire with the good life. Here's a peasant Jewish preacher who's been bugging other Jews. Do you really care? Are you really going to risk your life? Are you really going to risk your career to save this Jewish preacher? The, the Rome being in on the conspiracy, why? What does it benefit them? Why would they care? Even where you see in the gospel accounts that Pilate realizes he's being played and he doesn't want to be played, he still doesn't stop it. He still doesn't save Jesus, does he? He still goes through with it, you know? 
Others being in on the conspiracy. One of, one of the things I love is the idea that the disciples are in on the conspiracy. So Jesus has set them up. Jesus has told them, okay, I'm going to take these herbs beforehand, so I'm not going to die. But then I'm going to look like I died, right? And so then they're going to put me in the tomb. Then you guys got to come get me, okay? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we've got 11, because remember Judas, he's out. We've got 11 mostly fishermen, one tax collector, and we don't know all of the career choices of, of all of the disciples, right? They're Jewish peasants. They're not the Navy SEALs. They're, they're not the Green Berets. They, they apparently have one or two swords. You'll remember in the Gospel of Luke, it mentions we have two swords, and Jesus says that's enough. There's Roman soldiers guarding the tomb. How are these peasant fishermen going to overpower the guards with just two swords? By the way, they're going to keep this a secret. Nobody's going to say, hey, remember when the, the guards got their heads handed to him by the disciples? Not only all of that, they're also going to move the stone. They're going to get the body out. The body... Jesus needs a doctor. You know, I mean, it, it, can he even walk? You know, depending on where the nails went into his feet, are they going to have to carry him everywhere? And the Roman guards are still there, right? So the, you can see why the swoon theory has really fallen out of popularity. Oh, I must not have, uh, I must not have finished my slides. I'm sorry. Let's go back a moment. I definitely wanted to, uh, I definitely wanted to, address this because I, I think it's an error that I think does need addressing. Um, how many people have heard that all of the apostles, with the exception of Judas and John, then eventually were martyred? You've heard that. The problem with that is most of them, it's tradition. And sometimes we have traditions that contradict each other. Matthew is one of those good examples. We have three different later traditions about the outcome of Matthew. One says he was crucified. One says that he was ran through with a spear. And one says that he died of natural death. And all of these are some 300, 400 years after the fact. Now, we do, though, have good early testimony to the martyrdom of Peter. How did Peter die? He was crucified upside down. Now we have a second century document that the church rejected that has the story of Peter being uh, crucified upside down. However, before that, <clears throat> we have Clement, <clears throat> first Clement writing sometime between 70 and 90. Uh, first Clement says that Peter and Paul were martyred. Uh, Tertullian, the, the Roman historian, uh, specifically says that um, Peter was also martyred. And so we have those stories very early. We have Peter, Paul, and James, James the brother of Jesus. We have good testimony very early that they all died as martyrs. And so the only point I want to make is that when it comes to anybody other than Peter, Paul, and James, the, the brother of the Lord, when we appeal to them dying as martyrs, what we're appealing to is a tradition that they died as martyrs. We don't actually have good documentation, early documentation, that they died as martyrs. And I just wanted to bring that up. Uh, so so let, let's not say there was a conspiracy theory. Let's just say that Jesus woke up. You know, a couple hours later in the tomb, right? He, he's ba badly dehydrated. He's badly beaten, like you just said. He's got mortal wounds. Somehow he's able to get himself unbandaged. Somehow he's able to move the stone. Somehow he's able to overpower the guards. Somehow he's able to go off and hide for a couple days until he magically revives himself and appears to everybody as, as somebody that you'd mistake as a resurrected Messiah. Now, 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 let me ask you, if he survived the crucifixion, he, he needs a doctor, he needs intense care, and we're talking about ancient medicine, he's not going to survive, you know? But here comes this hobbling, broken, bleeding, dehydrated Jesus. Are you really going to run around saying he was resurrected, or are you going to get him to the doctor as quick as you can, you know? 
uh, Ron Gretchen. Substitutionary. Uh, this, is, this, this was a popular view. Uh, Jesus had an unknown twin. <laughs> yeah, Jesus had an unknown twin. He, he also happened to be born there in Bethlehem, and then he took off. Sometimes he took off to Egypt. Sometimes he took off to India. He just happens, just happens to come back the very day his twin brother is dying on a cross. He just happens to then show up three days later, and people just happen to go, oh, Jesus is back from the dead. Twin Jesus, whatever his name is, grew up in a completely different country, speaking a completely different language with a completely different family, and all of a sudden he, he just happens to show up on the right day. I mean, talk about, you know, circumstance or, or happenstance, and his family can't even tell. Well, you look like Jesus, but you don't talk like him and you don't recognize me. But sure, you're Jesus. <laughs> so, so twin theory is not a very popular one. Simon of Cyrene. Remember that as Jesus is carrying the cross, uh, he gets too weak and he can't carry it anymore. And the Romans say, you, Simon, carry the cross. So Simon helps him carry the cross. You know, you saw this in the Passion of the Christ, right? They get to Golgotha. And Jesus is able to slip away and they crucify Simon. <laughs> these, these, these are some really bad guards, aren't they? They can't keep the beaten guy with the crown of thorns on. They can't keep him straight from the guy that they just picked out of the crowd, you know, uh, 30 minutes ago to carry the cross. And so Simon gets crucified in Jesus' place. So Jesus, although still badly, you know, bleeding from the crown of thorns and beaten and so forth, he then lets Simon die on the cross. He somehow takes care of Simon's body. And he shows up three days later saying, don't worry, I'm back from the dead. You know? um, Thomas... Now, this is actually a popular view because of a late document. A late document. Does anybody remember what is Thomas sometimes called? Doubt Thomas. Well, Doubt and Thomas, but it, it, he also is mentioned as being a twin. twin. He's mentioned as being a twin. By the way, he's Jesus' twin in some forms of it. You didn't know that, did you? One of his disciples is actually the twin brother of... You, you, you guys aren't buying any of these. No. Come on, guys. <clears throat> an, identifiable, an identified man handed over to Rome, flogged under Roman guards, somehow switched places with anybody at the last moment, and the switched person, he's the one that died, and Jesus just hung out and came back three days later. <laughs> you can see why that's not a very good... Hallucination. This is another theory. This is actually Bart Ehrman's uh, explanation for why the disciples believed that they were seeing the resurrected Jesus. They were having hallucinations. Remember, though, we talked about groups. Groups saw him. The 11 minus uh, Thomas at one point saw him. And then the, the, them, on, uh, them with Thomas saw him. And then them uh, at the mountaintop in Galilee, they all saw him. The problem with hallucinations is hallucinations are in your mind. Hallucinations are not in other people's minds. I read this terrific story about the Navy SEALs, and you know the, the grueling torture that they put the, these cadets through in order to become Navy SEALs, including depriving them of sleep and food. That is a perfect recipe for having hallucinations. But when they're having hallucinations, they're having their own hallucination. They're not having group hallucinations. You don't have group hallucinations, do you? Um, <clear> Remember uh, 1 Corinthians, the creed, uh, it, it specifically mentions three different groups. The, the, the disciples, the... Uh, the disciples, the apostles, and the, uh, the, the 500 all at once. Once again, Bart Ehrman says that that's within two years of the cross. Visions themselves would not have convinced anybody of a resurrection. Remember I told you earlier that oftentimes people, people honestly, and I, I believe that they're being sincere, they believe that they saw their recently departed person, right? But that doesn't convince anybody that they were resurrected, right? 
uh, again, my own family that, that thinks my grandfather was there, you know, two or three days after he died. None of us went out there and said that my grandfather has been resurrected because that's not what a hallucination does not lead you to believe in a resurrection, does it? Uh, and what it could lend you to believe is that he's been glorified. He's been, he's been ushered into the, the, the Abraham side. And that's then what you would go out preaching, huh? You would preach that Jesus, he was a good teacher, he taught good things, he, he was a martyr, he even died for his cause, and afterwards we saw these visions that tell us that God took him to heaven, and he's up there in heaven, and da, da, da. And we would never begin telling people he was raised from the dead, because again, that's not a Jewish concept, that's not the language that they used. And there we are. Any questions?